Dr. John Marshall serves as the Chief Equity Officer of Jefferson County Public Schools in Louisville, Kentucky. He's a product of Jefferson County Schools and returned to work there as an English teacher yay, uh, after college. He then became a coach and later assistant principal before being named Chief Equity Officer of Diversity, Equity, and Poverty for the district. Within his role, Dr. Marshall has made strides for equity improvement in their schools, where 60% of students are low income and more than half are of the students are black or Hispanic. Among his accomplishments are the creation of the district's annual equity scorecard, which focuses on the four key areas of equity the district works to resolve. Discipline. College and career readiness, Stacy, school climate, and culture and literacy. As one of the few chief equity officers in the nation, he oversees compliance and investigations, site-based decision making, student due process, equity and inclusion, student engagement, community outreach, restorative practices, out of school time data, and the Volunteer Talent Center. And I'm sure he's gonna tell us how he accomplishes all of that. <laughs> Dr. Marshall recently impacted the development of a new code of conduct in Jefferson County after conducting research that found that both low-income students and students of color were disproportionately suspended from school. He was recently recognized as a 2017 leader to learn from and that was by Education Week, which described him as an unwavering advocate for racial equity in schools. He is now traveling across the nation to share best practices from his experiences at JCPS to ensure all school systems can provide a more equitable education for their students, regardless of race, socioeconomic status, and zip code. Dr. Marshall describes himself as community-centered and future-focused. An elephant sits in the center of his conference table because he believes that improving the educational system first starts with addressing the elephant in the room. Unify Ed invited Dr. Marshall to speak today to share his experience and expertise with the Hamilton County community. It is his role to get the conversation started around equity. However, it is everyone in this room and the entire brass room community charged with developing a long-term, sustainable, and equitable action plan for each of our 43,000 students. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Marshall. Good afternoon. This is so um, again, it's kind of weird listening to people say the stuff I've done or I'm doing. At the end of the day, I'm an educator, English teacher, uh, government teacher, and now this chief equity officer. Thing. Um, and as we start talking about equity, and I'm honored to be here, and I have to take my hat off to this anomaly called Unify Ed, because as I go around, and speak and as I work with other districts, particularly my own, there is not this type of, there is not such an organization as Unify Ed. And pulling this group together, I, I think we uh, deserve or we should give them a round of applause for doing that because we are about to get into some serious stuff. So, I always start off with, I am not a motivational speaker, I am a confrontational speaker. <laughs> and I, I want to say that clearly. I am not here to upset, but I'm not here to apologize for what I'm about to say either. So as we move forward and as we talk about public schools and as we talk about challenges, there are some things that we must face. And I will not talk about Chattanooga per se, nor will I talk about Louisville, but I will talk about this educational system and the system as a whole. So bear in mind when I tell you that I am not a motivational speaker. So the first thing I say is, um, 
we have to forfeit this notion of a broken system. The system is not broken, the system is doing exactly what it is designed to do. And as we talk about what it is, it is designed to do, we have to situate ourselves as to where we are inside of the system that perpetuates the inequities that my now friend Jonas has put, up, put out. This system in which we are working in, this system in which uh, Dr. Johnson has dedicated his life to, must change. But as we put out um, Hamilton County School or their achievement and it comes out, ours comes out around October, I despise that it says Hamilton County Public School data. It should say Chattanooga's data. Because at the end of the day, it is not sitting on the just the shoulders of the teachers, the principals, and the superintendent. It is this room and it is everyone else that is involved in students. So as we move this work forward, now, Dr. Johnson, of course you know you're not off the, the hook because you do have a, a heavy load to carry, but it is, it is very, very fair to say that this is a community situation and we cannot let our um, system just put it on certain people. And we'll also talk about it's not fair to just put it on our parents as well. So I will not read all of these. Here are the objectives of today. Again, I'm a teacher, so we're going to explore the impacts of inequity. We're going to challenge some of the deficit thinking and the resistance that comes with it. And we're going to discuss your experiences. So as we discuss your experiences, this will be one of the first times ever that I have to Normally, if uh, there was room, I'd actually just be walking around because I'm not uh, uh, used to standing on stage. So who am I? Here are some of the accomplishments and some of the things I have done. Uh, doctorate, chief equity officer, one of few in the nation, English teacher counselor, assistant principal, published articles, blah, 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 blah. But that is really not what makes me. What makes me is the other side. And now we're going to talk about what the things I'm proud of. So. I, a lot of us have all these letters behind our name, PhD, EDD, all those good things. Um, the things that I'm proud of is DAD, SON, and my wife would say DUM. <laughs> I say that because that is what I'm most proud of. This comes with hard work and dedication and support. But the things that define me are the things you have to get to know. I'm very proud to be a father. I'm very proud to be a son. And even though uh, I get on my wife's nerves, I'm, I'm very proud to be a husband, but it's the roots of the thing. So when we start talking about grassroots, that's what we're talking about, the things that really make Chattanooga go. So this is, I am cute. <laughs> so this is me at, I think I was 10. Now here's what's funny. Just got in a fight, was suspended. Uh, I would fight a wall for bumping into me, still would. Um, but. What we're going to talk about is how does this child growing up in an urban core district, how does this child get to be in Chattanooga with all these things and all these acclaims? It is a system, knowing that the system was, is really not designed for me to make it. So as we start talking about things and we start talking about early childhood, and I know I was looking at some things and doing some research, Chattanooga is focusing on early childhood. That is very important, but we have to talk about a system that uh, could keep that bright-eyed, bad, uh, crazy boy moving forward. So let's talk about messaging. I had to end my prescription to this magazine. I used to think I was run a runner because of, net because of uh, narratives and because of things we say. So when we allow conversations and when we allow uh, descriptions of students to be monolithic and we hide behind this term diversity, and we'll talk about that more, we often get in trouble and don't even know it. We are often telling students things about themselves without saying a word. Systems make loud statements without making a verbal statement at all. And we're going to unpack this. Uh, I am a school teacher, so I am very fine with the awkward pause. But this is not me speaking. This is me asking you all questions. What is wrong with this cover? Run like a Kenyan. One of my best friends is as big as that door, and he's from Kenya. He ain't running like this. <laughs> but if we make monolithic statements about those kids and these kids, and this is how Kenyans run, what are we really saying? Now, I know not in Chattanooga, but in every other school district in the world, there are, there's a teacher's lounge conversation going on right now, Jonas, and it says, oh, not in Chattanooga, oh Lord, you have Jonas. Oh dear God, if you just hold on, and make it past your tenure year, you'll get advanced program classes. But just hold on as you work with those kids. We have already started treating Jonas like this type of monolithic message. There are teachers, and I met some today, 
right out of Bushy Tail, ready to roll. And I hope that they stay far away from the disruptors of the narrative of, oh, you're getting those kids. Oh, if you sit tight, the principle's going to change. Oh, hold on, Dr. Johnson's going to fix this and give you better kids. There's no such thing as better kids. We know parents aren't keeping their good kids at home, their best kids at home. We gotta get what you get. So as we make these statements, and as we talk about these microaggressions, I ask you to think about what are students hearing when they walk into a classroom and we haven't said anything. So we're gonna talk about pedagogy, we're gonna talk about curriculum, but we have to talk about the elephant in the room. Unapologetically, you cannot talk Chattanooga, you can talk, not talk about inequity unless you're talking about race. You cannot talk inequity unless you're talking about poverty. And these are the kind of statements that we have to look at. So the future in a glance. This is a school district uh, where the uh, community has tipped over. 87% of teachers in public schools, middle class white women. The majority of our urban school district has now moved over to non-white. There's potential, Dr. Johnson, for some cultural collisions if we're not careful. Unintended cultural collisions. But we still have school districts and systems that want to hold on to um, hold on to a way of teaching that is not conducive for the community that we have in. And having to change sometimes comes with resistance. But if we just stick with the numbers, if we just stick with the numbers, we understand that we're gonna to have to change this. Has or is this district, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, America, ready to really embrace cultural competency? Are we really ready to embrace teaching different? Or is it those kids have to subscribe? I'm here to teach, I'm not a, a police officer. I'm here to teach, I'm not a psychologist. Well, you are gonna to have to be all those things as the districts change. So we have to triangulate some efforts and this is some work, uh, this is some work around what we do. I'm kind of the equity guy, but what I believe that uh, Jonas and his crew is doing is looking at academic supports, data management and putting it together. I am not going to say anything outside of the data. And we're gonna to have to get past talking about what the data says. The data says what it said for the last 20 years. And shame on us if, if we're going to keep talking about it. We have created a system, and this actually is a, a strategy, I believe. I was telling the reporter, I believe it's a strategy to say, I don't know enough to make a decision. Yeah, you do. You absolutely do. So what are we going to do as we start talking about moving things forward? So we have to have some triangulated efforts. Um, so I'm going to talk about the equity scorecard. I'm going to talk about males of color and initiatives. And one, as we talk about the equity scorecard, and that's more so for the session after this, the equity scorecard was a shot heard across the community. That shot was not for teachers, not for principals, but it was for the community to really see the inequity. So Delquan Dorsey, Dr. Christian Dresselberg is gonna join me when we do the session. But if you look at the scorecard, it's data that you already have, but it's put in a way to engage the community. We have community that feel muted and marginalized. We have community that can articulate what's wrong. But then when you actually put the data in front of them and you encourage them to join us, you have to share this kind of data. And as we share this kind of data, what does that mean? That means that that puts Dr. Johnson on notice, that puts Dr. Marshall on notice, that puts everyone on notice, and we have to own that data. So as we move forward and as we talk about inequity, I challenge you to put data so accessible that it's in barbershops, where it is in Louisville. It's in churches, where it is in Louisville. It's in this venue, where it is in Louisville. And you can actually get community brokers. I, I can look around and see some of you all are the ones that vouch for communities, and if you say it, the community's behind it. You need to sit down with Dr. Johnson or whoever's gonna pump out data like this, get very versed in it, and kind of see where Chattanooga wants to and is willing to go with this kind of data. And then you have something to hold um, Dr. Johnson, others, and everyone accountable, including, let me caveat this, yourself. Including yourself. So, uh, males of color initiatives, we have to really look at that. Our research says other than girls of color that our males of color are disproportionately suspended, and your all's data says that too. Let's be clear, your data says that too. Your data also says that there's a lack of access to gifted and talented programs. And what, so here's where I pause. So what statement are we making if schools have a, pop, a um, student population of 400 and their academic success or their access to academics or high uh, school, school, uh, classes or rigorous classes is low, 
There's a school in the county that we work with, the high school has two advanced placement classes. Another one in high school across the street has, uh, across the uh, side of the tracks has 32. If we had to guess, you don't even know what city I'm talking about, that's not local, so don't go tweeting that. But <laughs> if you had to guess, what side of town is the school that has two advanced placement classes on? What does that community look like? You don't even have to answer that, but you know the answer. Versus this other high school that has all the advanced placement classes you need. And here's the thing, Dr. Johnson, I don't know about in Tennessee, to get someone gifted and talented certified is like an eight hour day. So why do we have schools that don't have gifted and talented programs and what are we saying to schools and communities that don't do that? So we understand, and this is where we're gonna start talking about, and we have some student helpers here. The, the, the narrative and the, stations, and the stations that we place students, it's very difficult, it's very hard. Our students can articulate, you do not need a chief equity officer if you have, you can make a chief equity officer a student. Our students know exactly what's going on and if we allow them to you can give them a voice as um, this organization is doing, you will hear clearly some of the inequities and we have to address that. There's research that says that students begin to start disliking themselves as early as kindergarten. There are school districts, and I, I want to figure out Chattanooga's this way. Students of color are outperforming uh, uh, white students in, before they get to public school. But then when they get in public school, all things equal, when they get in public school, the performance goes backwards. How is that systemically? How do we get to that point? They're outperforming before they touch the teacher, but then they get into the system and then the, it comes backwards. How do we do that? And what statements are we making around that? Um, stringent lanes of approval, and we're going to talk about this more. You can Google it right now. You will see Dr. Marshall telling the board, his own board, that the code of conduct perpetuates racism, is uh, disproportionate, and is broken. City almost lost their mind. And I'm, all I'm doing is giving out the data. Why is that? What does your code of conduct say? Does your code of conduct have subjective things in it? I have a twin brother. We look a lot alike. We have a very subjective argument that's very interesting. Who looks prettier, Rihanna or Beyonce? <laughs> we talk about it all the time, but it's subjective. So it's pointless as it relates to punishing someone for being right or wrong. What is disruptive in my house is, dis is not disruptive in your house. The disruptive uh, behavior or whatever it's called, what is it called in here, Dr. Jones? What's y'all's uh, code of conduct called? Does, you still have it in there? No, okay. so, so that's one of the things you can look. As we talk about disruptive behavior, what does that mean? The judgment of variability in Jefferson County was it could be a one-day suspension to a eight-day suspension. And particularly, the harsher suspensions went to students that looked like myself and Dr. Johnson. Is that the case here? I do not know, but I would venture to say probably so. And as we talk about, someone's giving me a thumbs up, as we talk about subjectivity, how are we going to address that? So again, you'll hear me say equity doesn't have to be hard, it has to be brave. Equity does not have to be hard, it has to be brave. And why do we have to meet about that for 20 hours? Get everybody in, we know what the infraction is that's uh, penalizing our students. We know what the infraction is and we know how to manipulate it to make it harsh. So why would we put that in there? Why would we leave that in there? Distrust and isolation, lack of faith and hope in education. And how do we keep perpetuating this? So we talked a little bit about emotional intelligence and so this is my first doodle. Uh, confession about me, Dr. Marshall has never taken a note ever in his life. All these little letters behind my name, I never learned by taking notes. I was a doodler. I used to get in trouble for doodling. Read the whole Don Quixote thing in English uh, in college, and it was doodle notes. My mom, and dad would get my, my mom and dad would get frustrated because everything I did was doodle. If we are understanding what's the gifts of all students, let them do what it is that allows them to get to the achievement line. Now my twin brother can come up here, literally look out into the audience, pick a table, remember where you sat, what you had on, and recall it a year from now. But ask the boy to tell you what he read and looked in. He can't do it. He is gifted as well, but it's a different way. I was not allowed to doodle in a lot of teachers' classes. I was, and no, I'm not an artist, as you can clearly see, but somehow or another, that resonates with me, and that was my way of understanding and internalizing. But I wasn't allowed to do that. Sent to the office, and guess what? 
Ninth, I won't age myself, but in the 80s, sent to the office to do them. And guess what they qualified it as, Dr. Johnson? Disruptive behavior. Disruptive behavior. So, and I grew up in the city that I love, best city on earth next to Chattanooga, Louisville, Kentucky, home of Muhammad Ali, the champ. But as we do this kind of work, we need to put students in a place where they can excel and thrive. Right now, the introspective question I challenge you to ask yourself is, are students in a space where they can thrive? Are students in a place where teachers can allegedly teach very pure monochromatic ways? And are all of our students, what is it, 4,300, Jonas? 43,000. I'm sorry, 43,000. Are 43,000 students in a place where they can thrive? So, We'll unpack this a little more, but as we look at our equity scorecard, excuse me, y'all, and I, I love them in the South where I can still say y'all and not Phil. So this is the map of Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. And we have this area, you can't see it, it's kind of pixelated. We have a red and a different orange color here. This is where our uh, the smallest amount of students or the least amount of students are going and our career ready. We can take the mayor's map for homicides and unemployment lay it over and it looks the exact same. We can take uh, the literacy rates, lay it over as we have and it'll look the exact same. We can take the adjudication rates, lay the map over and it looks the exact same. So you can't talk to me about blaming Dr. Johnson for all of that. You can't talk to me about blaming principals for all of that. If the map looks the same in every institution, we have a national systemic problem that we have to fix. And how do we fix that is own the situation. Now. Don't answer the question, and I already know what's in your head if you're honest. What is the color in social economic of most of the students in the red or orange? Take a guess, you know. So how do we do that? How do we fix this situation? As we look at the equity scorecard, one of the things we do is make comparison between schools. We have a school that has 40% college and career readiness, and a school that has 97% college and career readiness. Guess what the schools look like? Guess what the schools, uh, uh, the, the level of teachers you have inside those schools. So how do we fix all those things? So as we look at college and career readiness, some of the things, uh, this is not for Chattanooga, you can do it if you want. Some of the things that we start looking at is ACT boot camps and financial aid, FAFSA forms, free college applications, et cetera. Um, and as we do these things, there comes this political game of pandering is slowing down students. And we can sit here and meet, and we can sit here and talk all the while we have schools that are not making it. So how do we move some things forward? And I do want to go back, I do want to go back to this slide. And we're going to unpack extreme poverty, high poverty, et cetera. You're missing the boat if all you do is default to that. And I'm unapologetically saying that you are missing the boat if that is all you default to. And I will challenge you, I, I challenge you to challenge me on that as we unpack the data. I do not know what Chattanooga's data looks like. However, I do know that when we just talk about poverty, we're missing a big, big portion of our students. So here's where we have to start talking about some of our biases. Are we ready to unpack the biases that sit within our community? Are we ready to listen to what the kids and the teachers have to say? Are we ready to work on and not blame everything on poverty? How can such complete communication block exist, blocks exist when both parties truly believe in the same aims? How can such bitterness and resentment expressed by educators for, uh, of color be drained that all sores can heal? So how do we heal some of the pain? You have third, fourth generation Chattanoogians, Chattanoogans <laughs> that could, could tell you the same story as their grandchild right now and the pain that they've experienced or the joys. So how do we fix that? How do we get to a point? First of all, we gotta admit that there's been some wrongdoing and we have to accept that and we have to move forward past it and we have to understand that this child right here laying on his mother deserves every chance we can give him. And if we really unpack whatever this mother is feeling, she can tell you the worries but is she in a safe space to say, I'm worried about me giving you my black boy? I'm worried about giving you my black boy based on the data that Jonas just put out there. And how do we unpack that? Because not in Chattanooga, but if he came to Louisville, if he went to Las Vegas, if he went to Memphis, 
He's going to get suspended more. He's not going to be allowed to doodle. He's going to be in trouble for being energetic. He will be in trouble for acting age appropriate. That might not happen here. I don't know. I'm sure it does. But I, I just wonder if we're ready to unpack that. And are we really serious about that information and how we fix it? So what can be done? I need all of you all to hold that in your head because we're going to unpack our equity scorecard. But what can be done? Areas of growth and introspection. So there's a narrative out there. And my favorite poem. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh, eat well, and grow strong. Tomorrow I will be at the table when company comes. No one will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they will see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. Now that is not my poem, as you know, that's Langston Hughes. But are we sending students to the kitchen? And in spite of that, I don't know why I keep pushing this, James. In spite of that, you don't know a true story. Actually, when I give speeches, a lot of time I have a fidget spinner because I have nervous energy. So I literally, if I had, if I didn't have this, I'd be talking about spinning up. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm a mess. But as we move this forward, why are we are we still sending kids to the kitchen? And what does that look like? What narrative is benefiting saying that there are more students of color in jail than not, which is completely false? What narrative is benefiting us when it's, well, it's disproportionate because they don't act a certain way? So we have a lot of myths that are sitting out there that we must fix. I'm in special classes because I'm bad, not because I'm slow at learning. I don't like them and they don't like me. How do we fix some of these things? We either do multiple choice essay, short answer, the one teacher that allows us to allow us to show up, show what we know in different ways is all in trouble. Are our innovative teachers getting in trouble for being innovative? Oh, okay, Chattanooga, y'all trying to keep it real? <laughs> Dr. Johnson, you listening? Are our innovative teachers in trouble for being innovative? Because where I'm from, you have a curriculum, you have a timeline, you gotta get through it because John Marshall's coming through, Dr. Johnson's coming through, and if you're not here, you're gonna get dinged. I'm sure that doesn't happen here, but how are we supposed to reach this young man who already, we guarantee he has gifts? Science says he already has gifts. How are we going to reach him? They told us that they don't have time to switch things up. That is a system issue. That's not a teacher issue. That's not a superintendent issue. That is a system issue. Because then we will turn around and say differentiation. We got to differentiate, but we can't differentiate as long. We got to differentiate in this time of two weeks. And how are we going to fix that? And how do we address it? Do scoring rubrics give advantages for certain ways of knowing the expression? I was a doofer, but if you ask me to talk about the Bagarine theorem, or you ask me to talk about Don Quixote, I can do it, but if you ask me to write an essay, and I'm an English teacher, you ask me to write an essay back then, it was very difficult. So are our rubrics, now I'm talking about systems, not pointing the finger at anyone. How do we fix that, you all? How do we address that? How do we change it? Oh, do I allow culturally responsive based differences to shape perceptions of students? Have we taken on the notion of cultural competency here? Have we understood that there's changes in our demographics and our district, and how do we move that forward? When you interviewed, when you interviewed the superintendent, was cultural competency even brought up? Was restoration brought up? Was disproportionality brought up? Were the community members put in place to actually ask questions and challenge the way in which we do things? So here's some disproportionality, and we talked about that, and we talked about some um, mis- some of the wrong sayings and the wrong things that are going on as we talk about disproportionality. And are we ready to unpack that? Are we ready to really address that? So as a chief equity officer, one of the things that is my job, unapologetically, is as we celebrate graduations, as every public school does in May, I have to question what happened to the ones that did My job is to say, rah, rah, we've graduated the most students uh, ever and we've graduated the most students and gifted and talented ever, and we still didn't graduate everyone. And what systemically, where did we miss them? And how do we go back and fix that? And uh, you can't see that, but that's just some of the, um, the myths that we kind of talk about. So here, here is actually suspensions from a district under the title disruptive behavior. I will not ask you to raise your hands, but this is what children were getting suspended for. 
and look at the range of variability. Non-stop talking keeps minding, uh, minding the room's business, out of the area, hollering peekaboo. That student got suspended. In the same class, a student got suspended for disruptive behavior. Student is involved in an argument resulting in tables being pushed, tables being pushed and chairs being kicked and thrown, all under disruptive behavior. So we need to look at some of our policies around discipline and change the negative connotation of discipline. It takes discipline to be a decent husband. It takes discipline to be a good teacher. Discipline is not about punishing. Discipline is about creating a situation where all students can thrive. And it takes disciplined teachers to have a disciplined classroom. Age appropriateness this should never get that young man suspended. Ever. A student was disrespectful and rude in class. I don't know what that means. And systemically, if we have teachers and principals that aren't challenging with that, or APs, when they get that, there's something wrong with that. And notoriously, this is the kind of suspensions that are falling way on one side, and we don't need to unpack that, you can guess. So here is our Jefferson County graduation rate. It's a bigger map for you to look at and see. Same situation, our graduation rate. What would you all's map look like? Where on the map would it be red? Red meaning the lowest graduation rates. And is that systemically, how do we systemically change that? How do we move that forward? We have to start thinking about things in a bigger uh, context. The majority of students in the red areas of Louisville are the global majority and impoverished. So, and I was telling the reporter, I don't know too many other corporations where if we were failing the majority of our clientele, we wouldn't be ran out of business. And I'm gonna say that again, I apologize. I don't know too many corporations in America that if we were failing the majority of our clientele, we wouldn't be ran out of business. So, that comes with the love, because we are not going to get ran out of business, because it's a public school, there's an introspection that must happen. There's a level of commitment that must happen to move this kind of work forward. And it takes brave, brave work. Again, equity doesn't have to be hard, it just has to be what? Brave, brave period, point blank. So we have to look at this, we have to take this kind of data to move it forward. Advanced program, advanced placement, this is actually in Jefferson County Public Schools. Since I've been here, these uh, black dots are ones that we've added. But again, we've had schools that didn't have any. We had schools that didn't have any advanced placement classes. And uh, what are we saying? What are we saying to our communities? So um, as you think about getting the chief equity officer, hand, hand Dr. Johnson, I, I, would, I would encourage you to have a chief equity officer that's inward facing and outward facing. Or a chief equity officer that's willing to look, look at the system and challenge how it works. So here's some professional development. We're gonna unpack that more in our, um, in our small sessions. School culture and climate. Here's the first time I'm gonna tell you why you can't just default to poverty. Because our research in Jefferson County says, students of color, rich and poor, do not feel as if they belong to the community, the school community. Students of color, rich and poor, do not feel as if they belong to the community. I don't know if that's true in Chattanooga or not, but in Jefferson County, we have to address that, and we have to figure out what that means and why. Because if it was just poverty, then we would have only one group of our students of color feeling that way. So how do, the, how do we get into that? And how do we unpack it? That, that's up for you to decide. Now, also when you, uh, so Dr. Burke is actually putting the R equity scorecard on steroids. You'll be able to click behind our schools, and then we'll itemize the equity scorecard by school. And then you will really be able to see the school that you're sending your child to, where, they, where there's inequities. Now, let's be clear. The whole city ain't happy about us doing that. But we had and have a superintendent that is willing to let us put that out there. Now, the superintendent currently, the one that just left was asked, why in the hell would you do that? But this is what we talk about when it's engaging this group. This is what APEX is about, the transparency and the bravery to do it. So then you can articulate better what it is you expect from us, and then we can tell you what it is we expect from you. So this is the kind of brave stuff, for whatever reason, is put JCPS a little bit further out there, just because we're goofy enough to put, 
this kind of data out there and move it forward. Okay, so lesson. One of my favorite paintings. Tell me what we can already guess or know about this boy and this student. So we're in class now, so I need hands up or particip particip uh, participation. about the boy. I'm telling you, I ain't right. I keep trying to tell you. What else? The boy has talent. The boy feels safe. The boy has a good attitude. The boy has a good attitude. He's engaged. The teacher knows how to teach him. Cross-generational. So why is it when we walk into schools, the first thing we hear is, well, you know, this is a Title I school. It doesn't tell you anything. That tells you nothing. Someone said that they're poor, but look at all the other things that this boy brings to him and they don't have anything. So how do we unpack that and how do we pull that out of our kids when we always just default to poverty? Poverty does not say, does not tell us that this boy is loved. Poverty did not tell us that he is gifted. Poverty did not tell us that this man is truly accounting for this boy. So how do we do that? And this boy is well behaved, I can unpack that a little bit because this boy respects the person that's teaching. There's a relationship there. And that relationship is clearly personal and, int and intimate in a good way. Don't get superintendent jacked up. Intimate in a good way where you are close to the student. So when we start talking about lessons and we start talking about designing lessons, there's lessons that we must look in past what side of town they come on. Because this intelligent group right here just now just went further than poverty and didn't come from, from a deficit mind. But why do we do that when we start talking about designing our schools? Right now, Dr. Johnson walks in and hasn't met all the principals, maybe, maybe not. Tell me about your school. Guarantee you if it's a Title I school within the first description or two, people would say it's a Title I school. What does that tell us? And what does that mean? So how do we get past that conversation to understand that this black boy is accounted for by this grandfather or father or whatever he is. Does everybody understand what I'm saying about this conversation around poverty? Very, very important it must be had, but there's a richness in poverty that's not allowed to come through the door because we don't let it. And we default to it as this is the reason why the scores are the way they are. Because poor John growing up wasn't allowed to do them. Funds of Knowledge, and we can kind of unpack this a little bit. Again, one of my favorite books was The Adventure of Huck Finn. And my favorite part, you all, is Huck Finn is deciding on whether to call Miss Watson and turn Jim back in. And Huck Finn says, I know if I help this young man get to slavery, I'm going to hell. But he still tears the letter up that he was going to send to Miss Watson and says, well, then hell it is. That's a level of, because you're going to go through hell trying to do the right thing in systems sometimes. But that's a level of bravery that must be had to free all of our boys, all of our students. Because right now, it's much easier to turn Jim back in and write him up for disruptive behavior. It's much more difficult to say, I'm going to do what's right, I'm going to help Dr. Johnson do what's right, and I'm going to be brave and move it forward. Because right now, it is easy and allowable in most urban school districts to continue to perpetuate a system that is failing a lot of our students. So to value the learning process. So we start talking about with teachers how difficult it is to let students, uh, allow students to reach their full potential. I know a teacher that can convince a kid like me and Delcon from the hood that we are Huckleberry Finn. But that conversation must be had and it takes innovation. So when you can start letting the students internalize how they can be this student, this, uh, this kid that's trying to make it through a system that doesn't understand them, that is already tight past them, hug fence poor, daddy doesn't care about him, um, he's a heathen, not saved, all those things that were passed, I know that doesn't happen here, all those things that were passed on him. We look at it, one of the most brilliant people in American literature. Some of our most brilliant students aren't allowed to be themselves because they're not allowed to be brave and different, and we allow that. Now, was he disruptive? Heck yeah, cussed like a sailor. Bang whatever bad means, but brilliant. And Jim, someone else who wasn't understood, allowed that to come out of him. 
So selection of texts, learning materials that deal with problems and issues that students face in their lives. I don't think you have to change Huck Finn. You know, we talk about we need culturally uh, responsive curriculum. Actually, we just need culturally responsive teachers that can make it connect and culturally responsive curriculum. So here's my uh, favorite cartoon, so a uh, picture. It's very comfortable. <sighs> let's just put it on poverty. <sighs> let's just, thank God he didn't pull out the race. Yeah, gotta pull out the race card. Because it's, it's not acceptable to just sit here and talk about these inequities without talking about race. And we cannot just have that come. Now, poverty is crushing, I know personally, but that wasn't the only thing that was, uh, and I won't say in the way that was challenging. So we have to move that out, and we have to move that forward. So here's our, and we'll unpack this more. I'll, I'll jump into this real quick. And my good buddy Ashley Conrad and I were unpacking this. If it is about poverty, and you have this on your table, but we'll unpack it more in the discussion. If it is about poverty, why is a poor white boy and a poor black boy, why is there a gap in their performance? If it's about poverty or money, why is a poor black child and a poor white child with money, why is there a gap? See, we get a little quiet now. So how do we, how do we move some things forward? How do we challenge that? How do we look at it? bravely and say, we gotta look at the system, you all. Now, Chattanooga might not have this. Chattanooga might, I'm, I'm someone laughing, but I'm sick. Chattanooga might not have this challenge, but how brave is it for Jefferson County and other ones to do that and pull it out? So, uh, this former superintendent just said, we're not just gonna talk about poverty anymore. We're not just gonna talk about Title I anymore. If it's a need, let's put it on general funds. Show me your budget, I'll show you your values. Let me say that again for if, if, if uh, Johnson CFO's in here. Show me your budget. Now, so I never have to come back to Chattanooga again. If you let me see the budget, I can tell you exactly where you are or are not headed. Let me see the principal's budget. I can tell you exactly where you are or are not headed. Let me see how much a parent makes at home. I can't tell you where he or she is going. So we can't default to poverty as relates to the household. We can default to poverty as the budget. So that's a question that we're gonna unpack some in, in our um, in our breakout session. Statements that we make in public schools, and I'll just let this one marinate for a minute. Sure, not in Chattanooga, but you have schools, 90, 80% students of color in the books they can check out, and you might get three out of 100 with characters that look like the men. This isn't something hard to do. This is a policy or a practice that makes a statement that is crippling and microaggression crushing. This is the run like the Kenyan thing, but now we're inside the system in which we love. What does your library look like right now? Can this boy go check out a plethora of books about him or someone else other than Huck Finn? So how do we change this? That's a simple one. Get books that are diverse. Let them talk through it. Let them see characters like them because as where this seems simple, there's a lot of research that says the psychology behind the lack of access to main characters that look like them lets them believe that they're not a main character in the game of life or in their own story of life. You can change this in a year. You can have a goal, uh, not you Chattanooga, but systems could have a goal to have diverse libraries in a year, two years, three years, however it looks. Show me your budget and you'll know what? Until hidden figures is not hidden, it's a travesty. Let me say that again. So now we're talking about curriculum. The mere fact that hidden figures is hidden is a travesty. How do students of color feel about themselves if they actually knew that the reason we went to Russia was because of some systems? That's a totally different curriculum and a totally different narrative. The greatness of us was not dropped on the world stage at slavery. And it wasn't dropped on us just in February. So how do we get our curriculum to be more fair and equitable and louder about the greatness? And how do we do that? That's a, te that's a systems thing. That's a curriculum thing. That's an access thing. That's allowing teachers that understand this and want to do it today, the ability to do it. But right now, the people that got us to the moon were some uh, heroes that didn't look like these ladies until the movie came out, blah, blah, blah. 
But do we understand kind of uh, what I'm saying about this? We're going, and that's a pixelated um, February, but we this just go all out in February. Go all out in February. I asked the student that I admire and his family, I said, what have you learned about you know, yourself and your culture? He said, innocently, I gotta wait till February. Didn't mean anything about it. And this is a student that's making A's and B's. But he said, I gotta wait till February. So when we start talking about the inoculation of systems, that's not okay, you all. And the curriculum is something we can change. Not at Johnson's level, not at my level, but at a policy level to move things forward. Um, teach students of color to love themselves. Expose students to role models of color. Disruptive, uh, disrupt the single narrative. And we all know this kind of stuff, but we have to put us in a space where we can talk about it better. And we have to hold everybody accountable. Impact the often reported false misconceptions. One third of black men in the United States will serve time in jail. Why is that a positive narrative when there's 600,000 more black males in college than in jail? Who benefits from telling such a negative story? And I, 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 that's not a question to be asked, answered, but that is actually out there. Brother Dr. Alvin Tolson always talks about the power of myth versus fact. There's 600,000 more males of color in college than in jail. Now, I guarantee you some of you all didn't know that. And I guarantee you this boy might not know that. So how as educators and pedagogists are we inoculating him by letting that myth sit out there. Well, the media doesn't do us any favors either. But we have to we have to change that whole narrative. Black males are a dying breed, false. Well, that's definitely false. Um, black male youth today are more violent than any other previous generation in the 80s and 90s. Now with heroin is ticking back up, that was a very violent time in our urban core district. And I want I will send Jonas the article from Dr. Ivory Tolson to kind of unpack this more, but we have to start controlling the narrative better. We have to start controlling the narrative better. And it sits within each system and every system. Um, our theorizing should deal less with abstract concepts and should be rooted in tangible commitments. I'm gonna say this, and if Unified Ed is about what they are about, I would say they agree. Don't bring me another committee. Bring me a commitment. Do not bring us another committee bring a commitment to do this right. Do not ask Dr. Johnson to pull together a task force that is not tasked to do anything, but get on TV and be interviewed. Move this work forward. No more committees, because I have become to believe that a committee is a way to stall. That equity data is not gonna change by a committee. The equity data changes by commitment and information. Shame on us if this boy graduates from uh, Chattanooga Public Schools the same way maybe his uncle, brother, or someone else did. Shame on us if the system doesn't change. Do not bring me another, I, uh, Jonas will tell you, I turn down speaking engagements if I think it's to check off that you had a black guy come talking about black stuff. <laughs> I ain't, I'm not doing that. I'm not the mascot of equity. So how do we move this work forward in such a way where we are serious about it? No more committees bring commitment. And inside that commitment, it takes bravery. You can't do your job if you're scared to lose your job. So if you're going to do this job seriously, the way the system is set up, it's gonna come with some flaws, it's gonna come with some drama, it's gonna come with some resistance. But if you're serious about saving the dupler that was me, it's gonna come with some serious, serious work. No more theorizing on what we need to do. The data's not gonna change until the desire to do better changes. So we can talk about privilege, color, but this is the stuff that scares people. I don't know where Chattanooga is, but we need to talk about this, and we won't talk about it here. But I ask um, every last one of the people I've interviewed, we have to talk about the difference between equity and equality. And I ask, do they see color? If they say no, I kick them out the door right then and there. Interview over. Because we have to see, I have three beautiful daughters, three beautiful daughters. I want every teacher that stands in front of me him or, or stands in front of them, him or her, the teacher, to recognize what that means and what it doesn't mean and make no assumptions. So this whole colorblind thing, that's garbage because at the end of the day, you have to know that because that's the qualifier for everything else, but it's not a qualifier for judgment, that's crap, that's not accurate. So how do we move that forward? 
I want you to know that this is a young black boy that's growing up in Chattanooga. And I want you to go a little bit further and know what that means. Um, all black ball headed men, do y'all mind standing up just for a second? Seriously, do y'all stand up just for a second? So, let's talk about this just for a minute. <laughs> so, as we talk about diversity, as we talk about diversity, we go back and forth on what diversity means. I promise you, if you sat us down and had us in the corner and asked us questions on our beliefs, our faith, our diet, how we practice, there's diversity inside of a community that we tend to forget. But here's the funny thing. We're not bothered about diversity in our own town. I don't know about Chattanooga. Thank you, brothers. You can sit down. <laughs> I didn't know here. But uh, there's not an argument about diversity as it relates to our alternative schools that are all black males. But let us say we want to do something different for our own boys, and it's oh, we're going back on the diversity rules and all that, but we're not bothered that our jails are full of black boys. How come we're not saying, well, there's no diversity in your jail cells, there's no diversity in your alternative behavioral schools, but we default to diversity in different ways. Again, my brother and I are very diverse, so how do we move that work forward? Do not let diversity be another scapegoat for doing real work, because diversity is different. All you need is two people in the room. All you need is two people in the room. Do you have equity? Do you have inclusion? If you don't decide how to find diversity. So we have to talk about that. Implicit, implicit uh, isms that must stop, and we gotta face those. We must face those. So, and I hope we have uh, internet access. I don't even know how we would activate that. Do we? So, and before we do this, I want to ask you, who taught these babies this? And as we talk about that, then I will close after this. Who taught these babies this? And we talk about self-molding and we talk about imaging, because I can guarantee you this, the same parents that we say we need our parents involved did not teach them what we're about to play. visited the Kenneth Park Doll Test, originally centered around integration uh, of separate but equal, as my sister talked about here, and they asked students of color to pick the doll that is good. They asked black students to pick the doll that is good. They picked the white doll, 15 out of 21. Asked the black student to pick the doll that is pretty. They would pick the white doll. Asked the student to pick the doll that uh, is misbehaved. They picked the student that looked like them. So who taught them this? And I'm not blaming anyone in this room, but we are sitting inside of systems that are inoculating students to pick something that doesn't look like them to represent good. Now, I don't know if you are the one perpetuating this or fighting with that breaks my heart. Perpetuating this or fighting that, but that's where I take my hat off to organizations like Jones. That's where I take my hat off to people that are here trying to do this work. There is no reason, there's nothing wrong with it. She just raised the back dog because that one's not pretty. But she looks just like it. So when we, and you can kill it, that, that's kind of a, And uh, you can look it up, YouTube, Kenneth Clark, the, the doll text. The Black Doll Project. And that's a long road. Um, but as you move that, hold on, Jonas, I was gonna go back to something. Okay. Or am I done, am I done? Okay, so. To go back to the slide. Okay. Yes. So you all, I am truly um, just someone that believes that, is, and let me be very clear, there is no, show me an educational system that fails and I'll show you a nation that fails. So we are at the precipice of doing right or wrong and we are at the precipice of doing great things. I challenge you not to just expect the educators to educate our children, but have a high expectation for us to do our part. As we move things forward, and as we uh, try to challenge our work, we have to work collectively together. There's negative images out there that we are perpetuating as a system. There are students and parents in this room right now in a safe space to 
make the front page of the time based on their treatment. And they still have hope in us, me included. So how do we move this work forward? And how do we make sure that we can save all children? Um, as the Chief Equity Officer, and I would encourage uh, Ted Anuga to look into looking at equity data, if not an equity officer, I really want us to really start thinking about that collectively and moving that forward. Again, I'm not a motivational speaker, I'm a confrontational speaker. And, um, and, and as, a, one of, as my pastor would say sometimes, tell me when I'm not in the book, tell me when I'm not in the data. Challenge me, I'm not wrong with anything I just told you. So as we start talking about what we're going to do, don't talk to me about what the data says. Talk to me about what you're going to do about the data. Because I don't even have arguments about the data anymore. You can click any urban school district and it looks the exact same. So we can't blame the parents because the parents are teaching kids banjo lessons the best they can. We can't blame just the school system because in JCPS they're only spending 19 to 32% of their time in school. So there's a whole other world of learning that is happening that we must move some things forward. And 15, I end with this, 15 out of 21 students in 2002 or whatever thought that because the dolls that looked like them were better than them. And who taught them that? Uh, thank you. Hats off to my, my people back here, Jonas and that group. I appreciate it. Thank you.